Hello friends, uh, let me first introduce myself. Uh, I am Anand Prakash and I taught English literature in Delhi University for more than four decades and retired from there. I have written a few books on literary theory and criticism and also uh, discussed uh, plays of Shakespeare uh, which were published in, in, in different magazines. Uh, uh, welcome uh, viewers and uh, today we uh, discuss uh, Shakespeare's uh, famous play, uh, Henry IV Part I. And uh, when I say Part I, then uh, uh, one can assume that there must also be another part and there is indeed a, a, a second part of the same play. And uh, uh, there may be a confusion that the play doesn't uh, end here at the end of uh, Henry IV Part I that it goes into the next, which is true and not true. In the sense, it is true in the sense, you know, that uh, the sequence of events is extended further into the next text. At the same time, when the, this play ends, this ends on a particular note and uh, that's a proper ending. So one can call it uh, an independent play by itself. It is considered an uh, independent play. In fact, there are books on Henry IV Part I and uh, there may be certain characters who have uh, been focused more in the second part and there are others which are focused more in the first part. And uh, there may have been a change also in the characters and the situations uh, uh, from the uh, part one to part two. So uh, it's a question that scholars should sometime discuss also extensively uh, whether you know these plays were uh, independent uh, literary aesthetic entities or that you know they would make sense only when they were read together. And uh, I'm of the firm opinion, and uh, this is where the uh, uh, Shakespeare scholarship also is agreed, that uh, Shakespeare's plays, whether they are in parts or whether they are uh, just, just uh, with an independent title, they are in fact independent texts. And uh, Henry IV part one is the, in, in that sense can be discussed, uh, you know, um, apart from other plays of Shakespeare. Uh, with this uh, brief, you know, uh, note on uh, Henry IV part one, uh, uh, I begin with, and uh, uh, this point has been discussed in the earlier discussions also on Shakespeare, uh, you know, we begin with uh, this play as a history play. It's a play about history and uh, that history is English history. Shakespeare, in fact, wrote a large number of plays on English history and uh, there may have been a specific purpose in his mind why he uh, wrote these plays. Maybe he wanted to acquaint the, uh, you know, uh, audience of the time about their past, about the logic of their past, the way that logic finally crystallized at the time when Shakespeare himself was writing and Shakespeare, as all of us know, was writing from 1589, 1590 to 1610 or a little later also. So in these 20 years, Shakespeare saw history in the making and then uh, his uh, attention also uh, went back to the period when England started, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as, as a country, as an independent country, as a nation, and uh, the changes that took place in the process of its becoming a country. And uh, so far as uh, this play, Henry IV Part I is concerned, this captures the English history in 1400. So, uh, our viewers, you guess the gap between <coughs> the, the, the play that we discuss and the time that is captured in English history, the gap is almost of 200 years. And Shakespeare is looking back 200 years to see what England was like at that point of time, whether it had certain seeds of the present, Shakespeare's present, or whether it was a totally different place. So uh, these were the uh, concerns of Shakespeare at the time, and uh, he must have, uh, you know, seen certain parallels uh, between what happened in England in 1400 and 1401 and 2, or what happened in England in Shakespeare's own time, which was, so far as the plays are concerned, uh, uh, from 1590 to 1610. And uh, this play uh, itself was uh, composed uh, in 1500, uh, 1596 or 97. It was printed in 1598. So that date is there that uh, it is printed in 1598, which means Shakespeare must have been grappling with the theme for quite some time. And uh, what made Shakespeare grapple with this aspect of England at that point of time is the question. 
viewers and you should discuss this question in your own mind. You can in fact read books from this angle as to what inspired Shakespeare to write such a play as this. And uh, my uh, own you know, view is that Shakespeare was confronting certain socio-political problems in the 1590s. And uh, Shakespeare was a very conscious person, a very intelligent and sensitive person. He read a lot, he discussed a lot, he worked you know, on his plays. He constantly, he, he consistently discussed uh, you know, his uh, plays uh, with, with his players, with his, with his, with his actors. And uh, you know, he always had a, a close you know, eye and uh, he, he, had a, he had a very uh, you know, alert eye, alert mind and he, he could gauge you know, the, the uh, response of the audience who came to watch his plays. So uh, all these things you know, uh, made Shakespeare conscious about his role as a writer. And uh, in this play that role is very clearly seen, Shakespeare's concerns are quite clear. And uh, I'll be making a few points about this play and then this discussion can be extended by you uh, in, your, in, in your own effort to understand Shakespeare in, gen uh, in particular and, and literature uh, in general. So uh, <clears throat> I start with uh, these two time parallels <clears throat> which I've already indicated, uh, 1400 and 1590. And uh, there, there must have been something common between the two that you know the, the trends that uh, Shakespeare was confronted with these trends may have started sometime in 1400. Uh, well, what those trends were, one, one can uh, obviously go to the history books, one can uh, go to Shakespeare's other plays, one can go to the writing that may have occurred in 1400 because you know, we have a writer, uh, uh, Chaucer, who dies of course in 1400, but then this person was there till 1400 and uh, uh, well, there, are, there must have been others also. Uh, not much literature is available of the, of the early 15th century. But then uh, when Shakespeare lived in the 1570s, uh, 80s, 90s, all these years, then he must have been hearing about, must have been reading certain things about 1400, the kings, etc. So uh, when he wrote this play, he must have been reminded also of what happened in 1400. And the reminding came because uh, Shakespeare uh, was critically looking at uh, his own time, uh, his, his, his own surroundings and uh, England in the 1590s was a country bubbling with energy but at the same time visited by a large number of conflicts and difficulties. So uh, England has uh, that, that kind of you know, uh, energy in, in 1590s and people are becoming restless. They, 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 they are not uh, as, as docile, as, as servile. Uh, as, as peace loving as they may have been or they are not as suppressed and oppressed as they were earlier. So they ask questions and Shakespeare as one of them, as one of the people in England at that point of time must also be asking certain questions. And these questions seem to be partly answered in this book. What are those questions? Uh, well, what one can go into this uh, aspect and then one can understand this text better. So the two time parallels, 1400 and, uh, and, and uh, 1590 and, and uh, uh, certain things are common. Certain things are different also in the sense you know that people now want to know as to what is wrong with their life. And uh, when you want to know what is wrong with your life, when I want to know what is wrong with my life, then of course I go back to my past. And uh, there were certain things wrong in Shakespeare's time. For instance, uh, th there was starvation, there was hunger, there was poverty there was illiteracy, there were prejudices against women and these were increasing by the day. And imagine uh, when Shakespeare was writing that the monarch was a queen, monarch was a woman and, uh, and yet you know uh, there was this kind of gender prejudice. Uh, the, the queen was uh, supposed to be suspect in the eyes of a large number of people and uh, the queen may not have been accepted as a, as, as a true ruler in, uh, in one sense that she, uh, it, it was a woman. In the second sense that she was not perhaps, this is what people thought, she was not perhaps the legitimate heir to, to the throne and that you know she was the uh, daughter uh, out of you know illicit relations, uh, illegitimate, uh, she was uh, an illegitimate child of, of, of her father, one, one, one uh, would say that and uh, she was the daughter of Henry VIII and uh, she was from the, the second wife and uh, of course there is a lot of controversy about the, the, the second woman but then uh, there's no point going into it, but then uh, there were gender prejudices at the time. And these gender prejudices plus poverty, illiteracy, 
backwardness in the country at that point of time. All these made life very difficult in the 1590s to live. And uh, Shakespeare uh, and the, the whole uh, nation was asking questions about why this is happening and where are we heading. And uh, when you ask the question where you are heading from, uh, from the state of present disturbance, from the, phase, uh, the uh, uh, you know, phase of uh, the, the present uncertainty, where do you go from here? If that question is asked, then some people start asking what happened yesterday. And uh, well, yesterday means uh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And then Shakespeare must have struck upon the idea, uh, must have hit upon the idea, you know, that there was a time when the same kind of atmosphere prevailed. And if that, that uh, atmosphere was there 14, uh, two, two, uh, in 1400, uh, 200 years ago in Shakespeare's time, then there was definitely a uh, point in going back to that time and see how the, the country was uh, governed uh, then and who was the ruler at that point of time. And of course, uh, Henry, a, Henry IV part one has a ruler called Henry IV. And uh, well, when you read about, when you see Henry IV on the stage, uh, behaving in a particular manner, taking certain policy decisions, facing certain difficulties, then you are reminded of the present monarch, that is the queen. So th these parallels occur. So they are time parallels. And uh, when, when time you know, uh, the, uh, has this kind of a parallel uh, in front of oneself, then the old figures come back to life. So uh, people would have discussed uh, with one another and uh, gone you know, investigating in their own minds also the similarities and dissimilarities between 1400 and 1590. So this, is a, uh, this time parallel is to be kept in mind. And this, this raises the question, and I, uh, I sometimes raise these questions in my classes also, is it a history play or is it a contemporary play? It's a history play because it talks about the 1400, talks about you know the, 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 those times, uh, 1395, 1400. At the same time, the play is written, presented, and appreciated in 1590s, the, 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 the last decade of the uh, 16th century. So the play is about that time. So the, if the question is asked as to uh, which time the play is about, then, the, uh, then there are two options before us, and both options are equally important. That it is about 1400, that it is about the ab about uh, 1600 or uh, 1590s, and uh, these these two go parallel. And if they go parallel, th th then this uh, you know uh, uh, play becomes very interesting, uh, significant to understand, and, and it will definitely help you know the audience in the uh, time of Shakespeare. To, to assess and gauge their own roles in life. So uh, this, this is the point that uh, I, I wish I should uh, you know, share with you. And uh, then you know, uh, th there is one thing very remarkable about this play. It's a history play. And a history play means that it will talk about the policies of, of, of the kings and princes, which it does. But you know, very strangely and interestingly and significantly, this play gives a lot of space not merely to historically important figures, such as the king, such as the, such as the courtiers, such as the lords. It also gives a lot of space to the common people. And uh, Shakespeare had no idea. Nobody in, in Shakespeare's time had any idea about how, how common people lived in the 1400. So Shakespeare then, interestingly, would have gone to the street, seen the common people them, uh, himself, uh, you know, uh, behaving there, uh, facing their problems. And he incorporated, he, he you know, uh, brought them in his, his, his play, and, and he made them work on the stage. He coined dialogues for them. He, he, he coined a particular vocabulary for them. He picked up those words, you know, from 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 life on the street. So, uh, uh, in fact, when I was uh, reading this play for this lecture uh, yesterday, then I was struck by this idea that a large number of pages, which would be almost, you know, uh, uh, more than one third of the pages in Shakespeare. These are devoted to the life and uh, you know uh, you know uh, situation of the common masses. Uh, I, I started counting. I didn't have time to count exactly, but there were definitely 40 or 45 pages, and the play is 100 pages. So, which means 40 percent of the play is about the common people. It gives them space, and viewers, when uh, a history play, and by Shakespeare in his own time, uh, you know, uh, takes this kind of a position on life and uh, considers the life of the common people so important as to put it there in black and white and on the stage 
and uh, when you know the the common masses are shown on the stage and common mas masses are watching the play so in a way they are watching themselves on the stage and they would definitely be comparing shakespeare's view of the common people uh, and and the common people themselves their own view so the, the play would have been a remarkable hit in the 1598 and 99 etc and it's one of the most popular plays because the people are seeing their own images in in, in this play so uh, this is the point that i want to make that you know it's a it's a play about history it's a play about king it's a play about the prince it's a play about the court it's a it's a play you know that depicts also the, that that presents also the battle scenes the the, the conflicts for you know uh, grabbing territory and 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 you know uh, earning the uh, benefit of uh, you know ruling or governing or being a part of governance it is that at the same time it's a play that talks about life on the street i also raised the third question and then i'll go into the uh, textual analysis uh, is it a history play is it a social play play about society or it's a political play because it is it is raising political issues and uh, the answer is inherent in what i have already said uh, it is uh, that you know uh, when the king takes certain policies uh, you know adopts certain policies starts implementing them is blocked by his adversaries uh, you know you know from, from uh, in, uh, while he is uh, implementing those policies and when all these things you know occur uh, in, in the life and in the behavior uh, in, in, in the time of the king then of course the king is raising these questions at the political level the policies discussed of the old kings at a particular time become a political issue and if uh, you know the, an old king henry fourth faces questions of politics in 1400 and later then of course uh, well you uh, uh, somebody can ask the question why why is it why are you raising those issues today and shakespeare would say well these issues, these issues are, are of interest for us also so if they are of interest for us then it's a political play because he is discussing the policies of the present kings indirectly and he is telling us this is what happened at that point of time and this is what the monarch is doing now and uh, these parallels can draw you into the political issues of your own time so i would say that uh, it is a history play but at the same time it is a political play and uh, the the political issues of the 1590s they are being raised consistently and in such graphic detail in such clear details you know that uh, you, you start wondering i started wondering when when i when i, when I read this play and i have read it many times uh, when I, i i started wondering whether england was actually facing these problems in the 1590s and the answer was uh, as as i you know uh, read books and uh, saw discussions that was actually the case so history play is a political play in the hands of shakespeare <coughs> now uh, friends i'll uh, uh, give you some textual details of the play uh, so that you know you can understand uh, from my point of view that is uh, as, as to what uh, the play is about let's uh, have a look at the character of king henry 4th king henry 4th uh, is uh, has has the dilemma of acceptability is he acceptable to the to the people of his own time why do i raise this question i raise this question because this person flouted certain rules of the game he wasn't exactly uh, eligible i'm using a modern term he wasn't exactly eligible to become the king of england and in fact uh, a large number of people called him a usurper the person who snatched the throne of somebody which legitimately belonged to somebody else so uh, before this person henry and henry fourth there was another king called charles uh, this uh, richard ii and uh, that richard ii was uh, not very popular with the masses and of course he was not supposed to be he was not answerable to the masses those were the times you know when uh, kings were supposed to be uh, you know uh, elected by in, uh, so this is this is what people thought uh, elected by god he was god's deputy and uh, charles uh, this uh, richard ii uh, uh, always thought you know that he was not answerable to the masses so he would not actually meet their requirements and uh, this was uh, to some extent uh, exploited by a prince called a, a, a lord called bolingbroke and uh, he he started you know uh, um, uh, searching for answers on his own and he wanted to become an alternative uh, to to richard ii and uh, then you know there was a kind of popularity that he gained 
And finally, uh, Richard was, uh, you know, an enmeshed in a large number of problems and uh, some kind of a war occurred and in that war, Richard II uh, lost and uh, Bolingbroke, you know, leading uh, the, the forces of opposition uh, gained strength, you know, uh, in, in that tussle and finally he became the king. So he was not king by, appointed as, as God's deputy. He didn't in fact belong to the family from where, you know, kings would come. So he, he was not an angevin. He, he didn't belong to that particular family of, uh, of France, you know, from, from where English kings came. So uh, he, he had no legitimate right to become the king, but then because he was popular, he had popular support, so he became the king. So this is the, uh, you know, uh, problematic part of Henry IV, that Henry IV became a king not according to the law of the land, according to the law of society. That, you know, uh, uh, he, he doesn't belong to a family from where the king would come. He is just one of the lords and he uh, gets some strength and on that strength he becomes the king. So he is called a usurper, he is a snatcher. He is a person who has already ousted the God's deputy and in fact in that sense committed a crime, or committed a sin. And uh, well, if you commit a sin and if you are a king and you commit a sin, then your uh, punishment actually also becomes the punishment of the people whom you rule. So England in fact is in for, that, that's what people thought. England itself is in for God's anger, to face God's anger. God is angry that his deputy has been you know, uh, taken off and another person who didn't have any right to the throne became the king. So, uh, and uh, that's how the play begins. In the first scene, the king is saying that uh, there is a lot of turmoil in the country and people, you know, are, don't follow the rules and there is total anarchy and one doesn't know what to do. And then he says, okay, now we can think not of our own country, we can think of, uh, you know, uh, invading infidel, uh, we, we can invading the, the other territories and we can defeat the infidels and let's go out for a war against the neighbors or, or against other countries. This is the usual trick of all successful rulers. You know, whenever uh, they are unable to solve their own problems, then they take the country to war. So everybody becomes a kind of a fighter against another country and people forget about their own worries. So this, this kind of a standard, you know, uh, trick, uh, the, the standard uh, method is also applied by Henry IV part one. Uh, Henry IV, uh, you know, the, 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 the king Henry IV, and uh, he toys with this idea, but as he is about to take a decision, he is informed by somebody that there is a kind of, uh, you know, tussle uh, coming up in, in English uh, life itself and that uh, some courtiers, some lords are getting together, ganging up together against him and therefore he should, uh, you know, uh, first tackle this problem. And the king says, okay, I'll tackle this problem. So immediately he starts thinking of tackling the problem of revolt from within. So there might be a civil war in England in, 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 this, pers in, in this person's time, Henry uh, IV's time. And uh, the, the major concern uh, in the play then would be how to curb the rebels, how to curb those people who are revolting against the dictum of the king. So if there is one major concern that one can think of in this play, that concern would be how to crush dissent, how to, uh, you know, avoid uh, uh, disunity in the country and uh, how to in fact establish unity so that good governance can in, in fact be ensured. So the division of the king, uh, division of the kingdom and, 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 and uh, anarchy in, in, in the society, these are the issues that, that the king is confronted with and then he has to solve these problems. How he solves the problem, whether he can or not and uh, whether he will be able to uh, gain acceptance from the masses. These are the questions, you know, that, that, that raise their head in the beginning itself. Now he has a problem and this problem is a very interesting problem and Shakespeare uh, you know, uh, makes good use of uh, the, the, this particular thing. That, you know, uh, Henry IV actually is at the receiving end of God's wrath. God is angry with him. And uh, God is, uh, you know, uh, somehow uh, uh, making life difficult for him. And one way that God can make life difficult for a king is that he will give him a wrong son, a bad son. And uh, the King Henry IV has a son who is not actually a successful king in the making. When Henry IV, you know, after some time dies, when he has, uh, you know, finished his innings, then uh, he'll be replaced by his, his, his uh, eldest son, and the eldest son is Prince Hal, H-A-L, 
he is Henry, so he is called Prince Hal. So uh, this Prince Hal doesn't have the qualities of a king. He is he, not very, very bothered about, you know, uh, learning the processes of politics. He, he should be groomed at this time. He should groom himself. He should train himself to, to meet the people, to meet the lords, etc., to become popular with them. And he doesn't want it. In fact, he doesn't spend mo uh, much of his time uh, in the palace or in the court. What he does is, and that's uh, uh, most fascinating for us, uh, he goes and, uh, uh, you know, talks to the, uh, the rascals, the, 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 the scoundrels, the, the wastrels in the country, people, you know, who, who have no role to play in life at all. And if you have such a king who is anarchic, in, uh, a prince who is uh, an anarchic in the behavior, then the, the, the problem is there for the king. Who will replace him? Maybe the second son. The second son has, has qualities, but then this, this will also raise issues of politics at the time. How can the second son become the king when the, when the first son, who is called the Prince of Wales, is there? So there are a large number of uh, political, uh, legal questions at that time. And uh, th there, is, there is no dearth of issues for, for Henry IV uh, in, in the beginning uh, to, to settle. And uh, in, in, this, in this way, the play begins. So when you, when, uh, Henry IV then has to tackle a problem at many levels. One level is that he has to crush the rebellion of the uh, opposition forces, the opposition lobby. The second is that he has to groom his son according to the requirements of kingship. Will he be able to do it? These are the questions that are raised. And then the play proceeds like this. The king uh, finally <coughs> uh, calls the prince uh, to, to himself and, and, and he gives him a long lecture. And in that lecture, uh, the king is very serious, he is very genuine. Uh, he, he says, uh, he, is, uh, uh, he says to, to, to his son, I have great affection for you. Uh, I think you should, uh, after, after me, uh, hold the reins of power and uh, you should play your role uh, properly, but you are not doing it. And if you are not doing it, then I am pained. And in fact, the king starts crying, you know, on the stage in front of the prince. Of course, nobody else is watching because they are in a closed room. And there he tells the, the, the prince that the prince is not behaving like one. And uh, then, you know, uh, the, the prince realizes that uh, he has hurt his father's sentiments and he should uh, leave his ways. He should not mix up too much with the wastrels and the, and the rascals. Uh, he should, you know, spend time in governance. So he says he will change his ways. Then the king, then, then there is a, you know, kind of a, uh, uh, there are battles between the king's forces and, and the forces of the opposition. And uh, the same prince who was supposed to be wasting his time this prince then, then, then you know, uh, decides to become uh, controlled and regulated in his life and he defeats uh, uh, under his leadership the forces of uh, rebellion and at the end uh, the, the rebellion is crushed and the king and the son have got together and there is a better sense of, of, of control uh, in, in the country than was when the play opened. So this is the plot line. The plot line is that the king is facing problems and the problems start from home also because he has a son who, who doesn't take his responsibility seriously. And on the other, all the other uh, you know, courtiers, a large number of courtiers, they are, they are uh, going against him and they are uh, getting their, their armies uh, you know, uh, together in order to fight the king. And there's a kind of a civil war to go on. And that uh, who, one doesn't know whether uh, the, the king's forces or the opposition forces would succeed. So this time of uncertainty will be faced by, by, by the country. And finally, the king and his prince, reformed prince, they will be able to hold the country together. This is how the play ends. So uh, you see that uh, the, the king is facing problems at two levels. At the level of the country and its policies and at the level of, uh, you know, improving his own son, his behavior, his value system. Uh, the, this is how the uh, prince is uh, visualized uh, uh, the, and this is how the king is visualized by Shakespeare in the play. The second character, uh, you know, of course, is the, is, is the prince. How is it that the prince in the beginning was so anarchic, so very irresponsible and that finally, uh, you know, he became a very effective king? This, this is another, you know, uh, 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 issue that, that Shakespeare, uh, you know, uh, depicts, so that the Shakespeare, you know, presents in the play. And uh, well, the logic given is that the king uh, was an outsider always in the country. The king was there only in the court. The king was only playing clever, you know, with, 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 the, with the people uh, with whom he uh, came in touch. 
But so far as the prince is concerned, he knows the nerve of the masses, the nerve of society. He has actually gone to the ordinary masses who are of course are called rascals and rightly so because they don't do any work and they create only mischief. So uh, Shakespeare has devised a, character, devised a trait in a character, Prince Hal, and because of this trait, uh, he is able to study the actual situations of the country at large. And uh, which means that you know uh, the, 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 the prince knows much more than the king. The king knows only the court. The prince knows the country. The prince knows uh, what is happening in the city, what is happening in the village, what is happening on the battlefield, uh, which people you know uh, have to be uh, uh, you know given attend uh, attention, which have to be uh, you know criticized. All these things the king doesn't know. The king knows only governance. He can govern as an administrator with a heavy hand, but. So far as the prince is concerned, he is popular among the masses because he spends his time there. So uh, Shakespeare is giving an answer very clearly uh, you know, for the stability of the country. And the answer is that the king has to be acceptable to the masses and the king has to be one with them, one with the masses. He should understand their problems. He should spend time with them. And in this play, and uh, well, I, I, I may not call it a history play from this, from this angle. Because in the history play, history is supposed to be molded mainly by the policies of the king. But here there is a king in the making. Uh, in, in this play, uh, uh, Prince Hal is not the king, but he is the king in the making. Here there is a prince who will tomorrow become a king and uh, when he becomes a king, he would have known the country inside out. He would have gone to their homes. He would have you know, sat with them and gossiped with them. He would have played tricks with them. He, he had, he had uh, you know, uh, uh, exchanged notes with them. Uh, he, he may have cracked jokes and, and, and all those things. So that way, uh, it is very necessary for a ruler to be close to the masses, to be intimate with the masses, to know their uh, you know, problems, to know, know their pitfalls, to, to know, know, know the difficulties they face, and then he should then understand. So in a way, England is going to become a, a strong nation, say Shakespeare in his time, in 1590s. And in order to become a strong nation, it has to take care of, take cognizance of the interests of the masses at large. And uh, this, you know, partly answers the question that I raised, how is it that uh, Shakespeare uh, in this play gave so much of space to the common masses? He did so because he wanted to create a sense of interest among the common masses uh, regarding the policies that the kings might pursue or the kings should pursue. So uh, th this is a play in that sense uh, and, and I called it then uh, a political play and that was the reason why I did it. <coughs> so we have a, a different kind of a uh, king in the making, Prince Hal, who will be king tomorrow but then uh, many people would, uh, you know, when, when he assumes the uh, throne, when, when he sits on the throne, uh, when he's there as the king, then a large number of people on the street would say, oh, till yesterday he was with us, he was talking to us, he was gossiping with us and he's our man. And when the people start saying he is our man, then there is stability and certainty in the country. So Shakespeare is giving an answer that the king has to be democratic, the king has to be human, the king has to think, the king has to be interested in the in, in the life of the masses. If the king doesn't do that, if he maintains a distance between himself and others, then of course the king will remain isolated. He will uh, rule from outside, and people will never ever support him will never ever give, give affection to him. So this is the, the message that Shakespeare is uh, you know, putting across uh, in this play. And viewers, uh, just on the side, let me tell you that England is moving towards this kind of an idea. Shakespeare is writing in 1600s, till 1610 he will be writing. He started writing in 1590. Uh, but uh, somewhere under the surface, a kind of movement is brewing in England. And that movement is that people want more and more attention. People want policies which will serve their interests. And in 1648, uh, you know, very, uh, 1642 to 48, uh, the, those, those uh, eventful years in English history, and the 42 and 48 are only 50 years away from Shakespeare, uh, the king will be ousted. The, 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 the country will start ruling itself without a king. And it's the parliament, you know, which will come into existence in, 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 in the independent sense of the word. So Shakespeare is able to uh, hear the rumblings of this kind of a change that is uh, happening at the lower level, at, 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 at the level of roots in Shakespeare's own time. And uh, th this play can then be called a successor to 
uh, apart from uh, along with the other plays that Shakespeare wrote at the same time, uh, it, it can be a precursor to, it, it can anticipate what is going to happen in England just within 50 years uh, of the time. So, you have Prince Hal here who is the answer uh, to, to, to the, to the uh, 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 problems that the king is facing and he is going to be a different kind of a king. Uh, he will be King five, uh, Henry V later as, as he becomes the king. Then you know uh, there is a, this is one answer to King Henry's problems, his son. His son is popular and popular among the masses, acceptable among the masses. There is another answer and uh, Shakespeare in fact uh, in this uh, history play is also uh, bringing in a large number of issues and he is uh, throwing the issues in front of the audience to, to consider, to, to take a position on and that other answer is the traditional answer. The traditional answer is that, that, that the king uh, is not uh, strong enough, the king does not have support of the uh, many lords etc. and there should be another person who is very strong and who has the support of many others and then who can ride rough, roughshod on the enemies within the country and outside the country. This is a traditional answer that the king is weak and uh, the, the, that, that the king does not enjoy the support of God and all those things. But then there will be another person, a more honourable person and I am using the word honourable in, in, in a different sense and I will uh, come to that later, that the king has to be honourable, the king has to be brave, he has to be courageous, uh, he, he has to be passionate and he should be ruthless with the enemy. So, this kind of a king will definitely rule the country better. This is the answer, uh, you know, uh, 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 at variance with the answer that Prince Hal is uh, providing in the play and there is another character and his, his name is Hotspur. Hotspur is that person who says be brave, be fearless, be defiant, be, be ruthless and, uh, and fight with people and do not think of anything else. Al always, always remain serious, have a nice army, fight uh, individually also very well and then you will succeed and uh, keep intact your honour, sense of honour. So, be driven by honour. So, uh, on one side you have Prince Hal who does not bother about honour who bothers more about simplicity, innocence, learning from others, joking with others, spending time with the ordinary masses and then there is another person who has uh, you know the answer that you have to be ruthless with the masses, if they raise their head in revolt then crush them completely. So, this answer is there and Shakespeare is working out, working it out very well. In fact, uh, if one uh, looks at the play from this angle as to what the answers are and uh, what process Shakespeare has uh, adopted in order to give the answer then uh, one might even say that uh, Shakespeare has created the character of Hotspur to present another view of kingship. So, Henry, Henry IV has one, one kind of kingship, Prince uh, Hal has a different kind of kingship in mind and Hotspur is, is, is the third alternative and Shakespeare is clearly rejecting the third alternative. He says there is no, uh, you know, uh, um, um, uh, there is no reason why the, the, the common masses should not be brought in, in, in the, the fray, uh, brought into consideration and it is from their angle you know that society should be judged. So, you have uh, Hotspur, <coughs> so there is a kind of triangle of, uh, uh, which will sort out the political problem in the country at that time and the triangle is uh, honour and bravery on one side, oneness with the masses on the other and the third person who is more of a uh, evil genius or a political genius or a clever person and that cleverly he first you know snatched the throne and now he wants to extend his reign further. So, these are the three answers and Shakespeare very clearly is answering uh, you know on the side of the person who will be more humane, more understanding, more affectionate and uh, who, who would be accessible to the ordinary people. <coughs> Well friends, since I am discussing this play as a whole, uh, I am also struck by the fact that so far as this play is concerned, there seems to be no role for women at all. Now is not it ironical that you know England at the time the play is written, England is being governed by a, a woman, uh, you know a monarch uh, Elizabeth and uh, that uh, so far as the, 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 this uh, England is, uh, this country England is concerned of course 200 years ago but then it is written, the, the play is written in the, in, in the 16th century. So, at that time uh, there is no role for women. There are one or two women in the, in, in the play, uh, I, I could think of three uh, you know important women in the play, uh, one woman who is, who is from, who is a, a kind of princess 
uh, she is, is a Welsh. She, she is not. She, she is not an English woman, and uh, uh, she can't even speak English. So uh, she she uh, discusses through her father, through her brother, but she can't discuss things herself. And uh, people don't take her seriously at all. So only two or three people on the stage would understand what she is saying, and they will interpret for the benefit of the audience. So that is one woman, which is for all practical purposes useless for us. The second woman is Hotspur's wife. She also is not taken seriously. I told you about Hotspur. He believes in <coughs> uh, bravery. Uh, he, he he believes in ruthlessness. He believes in courage and honor. And all these things, all these four things, they are not present in the case of women. So he doesn't bother about his wife at all. He he just brushes her aside. But whenever she comes in, he says, "Go away. Don't waste my time. I don't have time for you." And and he starts, you know, uh, rebuking her. And no, no, not exactly rebuking her, but uh, basically uh, giving no attention to her. And uh, this woman is uh, trying hard to tell him her point, but 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 she is not understood at all by the husband. So this is one woman, and uh, uh, Shakespeare is trying to show, you know, that. women didn't have any role in society at that point of time so they were there merely as pawns you know in the in the game of politics particularly in the upper classes if there was a woman then then you know she would be married off to another prince and because of that marriage you know uh, two territories to two countries uh, two parts of 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 of, of the regime uh, to two parts of the of, of the of the country they they they'll be put together so that kind of a passive role was supposed to be played by women then and kate the wife of uh, hert hotspur has this role to play of course there is a third woman and uh, this woman is from the common masses she is a uh, she she keeps an inn she is a hostess her name is mrs quickly and uh, there is a scene you know in which mrs quickly fights uh, falstaff falstaff i'll come to later she fights falstaff and uh, uh, the, the prince at that point of time sides with her so if there is any hope uh, so far as shakespeare is concerned uh from from women uh, in the country at that time it will come from the ordinary women and this woman you know can't speak uh, you know uh, uh, elegant english of 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 the period she can't speak you know in 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 uh uh uh, uh blank verse she she will speak purely in prose and yet uh, she she can she can leave her imprint on us so there there is a discussion about her but then being a, an ordinary woman being from the from, from the street this woman has no chance to ever impact the life in england so uh, this is the point about uh, women you know in history women have no role to play and shakespeare is quite clear on this that uh, they have already been sidelined by everybody so when you think of honor and bravery and all then uh, and uh, uh, policy and governance then people, women have have no role to play at all and i said the irony the irony was the best uh, ruler uh, uh, in in english history till that time if if not even later was queen elizabeth and in her time this play was written but then shakespeare was making this point very tellingly that uh, the, the conditions are not uh, you know ripe for uh, women to come forward and assume such important offices as that of the uh, monarch so after making this minor point uh, i i move to the uh, lobby of the king's adversaries these people i have already discussed it in fact uh, i i not, noted it down here adversaries were basically driven by the logic of greed by the logic of grabbing power and enjoying it and using this power uh, power to further you know increase the, the, their hold on the on, on, on the system and uh, the, these these were the uh, people who were uh, who who were governing their own territories who were keeping their own armies uh, who would who would get together and uh, defeat a third person and uh, if 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 uh, somebody became angry later with with one's friend then 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 they start thinking of revenge and this kind of a thing will endlessly go on in the country that the country didn't have a strong monarch and therefore uh, you know any group of people i could get together and they could out staking and then uh, you know divide the uh, country into, uh, into into different territories and then then they will name in fact there is a very interesting scene in the play where the uh, opposition forces uh, you know led by three or four people uh, uh, are, are 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 interested in only grabbing the territory 
So these three or four people, they get together and they say, okay, uh, uh, give me the map of England. So they take England's map and then they uh, draw, you know, their own lines on the map saying, uh, from this point to this point is my territory and from this point onwards on the left side or on the right side is your territory. So their job is not to govern the country. Their jo job is not to, you know, uh, uh, ensure uh, organized production. Their job is not to give uh, a sense of certainty or, or stability uh, to, to, to the larger masses. Their job only is to grab territories and to control them and to enjoy themselves. So uh, this is what the lobby is doing. And in fact, this kind of a lobby has, has been active, or had been active, uh, you know, since uh, 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 I think 1300 onwards, and because of which England uh, was not finding it easy to, to, to become a unified country. And uh, only, you know, in, in the Tudor period uh, did England become a unified country and it could be called some kind of a nation. So uh, this was a political question and uh, Shakespeare is uh, driving home this point further in the 1590s by making these people behave as if, you know, the country is meant only to be divided into certain, uh, you know, uh, important and, and, and certain uh, uh, warlike groups and people. So this answer is no answer and once again it's a political question whether the country has to be won, whether the country has to be governed properly and whether when you govern a country properly, you, you would crush these people or not. And the, the, the answer was that, of course, all these, uh, you know, uh, divisive, disparate tendencies, th these had to be crushed, otherwise the country could not be uh, kept together as one, you know, uh, unit. So Shakespeare is uh, uh, giving a modern idea of, uh, you know, after all, it's, it's uh, from feudalism to monarchy. So uh, Shakespeare in that sense is pro-monarchy and against that kind of feudalism, where the country has to be divided and there are independent armies. In fact, the armies, the army has to be only one unit in the country under the control of the king. And this process is being, you know, uh, gradually studied and investigated by Shakespeare and finally the conclusion is that in order to ensure unity in the country, what you require is a one king, a supreme king, a king, you know, who, who tells everybody uh, the, the, the respective duties of each so that the country can be kept together. So, so far as uh, the uh, opposition forces, the opposition lobbies of the king are concerned, they are, you know, divisive and uh, Shakespeare is taking a very uh, serious view of this and uh, he is presenting it uh, with the required kind of, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, seriousness. Uh, the last character in the play uh, is, uh, <coughs> uh, well, a comic character, but then uh, he is very political in his, own, in his own way. His name is Falstaff. Falstaff uh, belongs to the uh, to the uh, to some to, to uh, some you know uh, high station. He is he is Sir John, Sir John Falstaff. Of course, a, a minor a minor uh, you know lord. But then uh, he is a wastrel, and he always spends time drinking and uh, whoring and you know going to brothels and all, and uh, he he, he uh, cheats people. He is totally immoral, and uh, he uses language. Uh, he uses d double meanings always. And uh, he exploits not just uh, you know uh, the, the, the uh, rich and others, but he also exploits the poor people. He exploits women, and uh, uh, he he calls himself a kind of a leader of the prince, Prince Hal, Prince Hal, and and he are friends in the beginning of the play, and it's a it's a quizzical character, and uh, he is so lovable at the same time. He is so very entertaining. He is so very he 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 is so very comic in 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 the best sense of the word. That when you read scenes where, where he is in, in the picture, you, you start enjoying yourself as to a, as to a kind of, uh, I, I, since uh, there, there is limited time, I cannot you know, dwell upon this. Uh, on Falstaff, there have been independent books. And in fact, there is a whole lobby of Shakespeare criticism which supports Falstaff against Prince, uh, Prince Hal. And uh, I, I wouldn't go into that question, but then I would say that he has a view which is totally different from the view of all the three lobbies, all the three centers of power. He, he, he has a difference with uh, 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 Henry IV, he has a difference with Prince Hal, he has, he has a difference with Hotspur, the, the, these three centers of power. And he has a fourth dimension, and that dimension is that everybody is supposed to be, uh, uh, supposed to, uh, you know, uh, eat, drink and be merry, and, 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 and not, not, not bother, bother about any governance, 
not bother about any responsibility of the state, etc. And uh, well, cheat, thief, uh, loot, rob, these, are, these seem to be the call of life. And uh, well, you, you, you sit here and uh, you sit with your friends and you crack jokes and uh, if, if there is a, if there's a rich person passing by, then you go loot and come back and enjoy yourself. So this is this, this kind of a thing. But when he talks, when he plays games, when he's witty, then he's most remarkable. So therefore, you know, uh, one, one can say that uh, this kind of a situation may arise sometime in life when people wouldn't have to bother about their uh, you know, uh, responsibilities the way they have to now and that people can, then can enjoy. So he seems to be a symbol of enjoyment in the true sense of the word. Uh, that's one. And secondly, uh, he, is, uh, he, he, he makes a speech uh, at, uh, towards the end of the play and that speech, you know, uh, um, uh, tells us about a, a different paradigm of thinking. For instance, he says uh, in, in that particular speech, it's just called the honor speech. He talks about honor. And he is on the on 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 the on the battlefront, and uh, he is uh, you know uh, he's supposed to fight on the side of the king and and the prince, and he says he doesn't want to fight, he wants to just just, just cheat people even in the act of fighting, and when somebody says why don't you fight it's it's a fight for honor and then he says honor, I am fighting for my leg, I want to save my leg if my leg if my leg is cut off while I am fighting then what do I do with honor? I don't want honor, I want my leg. And th that speech is famous because you know the, the, that in a way presents the ordinary man's point of view. The ordinary man uh, doesn't want to uh, become victorious or this and that. The ordinary person wants to uh, ensure his safety, his physical safety. And uh, this person extends this view further and he, he is so convincing in that speech that if you, if you uh, don't look at things from the point of view of honor, then you realize that perhaps uh, he makes sense. So uh, Falstaff is uh, presenting a different view of life, a different view of entertainment, a different view of enjoyment. And uh, well, for a long time he was able to influence the prince's behavior. And uh, in, in, towards the end, you know, the, 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 the prince, when, when he is reformed, when he agrees with his father, and when he is moving, uh, uh, you know, inexorably towards assuming the office of the king, then this person has to part company with Falstaff. The, the, this comic figure, but till that time he was in his grip, and therefore Shakespeare is presenting a case very seriously regarding the so-called anarchist behavior of uh, uh, Falstaff, and Falstaff is a very endearing figure. The, 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 this is this is a person you know who will who will uh, you know uh, win love from, from from almost everybody. Every uh, all of us, all people, all human beings have that kind of anarchy inbuilt in them. They want to enjoy. They, they, they want to, they are, they are disgusted with authority, they are disgusted with principles, they, they are disgusted with consistency. Why not do what, what you feel like doing? And in that case, uh, if, if there are principles of morality that, that, that come in your way, you flout them. So they, this is what you know the, 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 this person is uh, saying and there are books and books on it and uh, some people call him, you know, the person uh, who will be on the side of Satan. And uh, like Satan, you know, as, as Satan had, uh, uh, you know, seduced uh, Adam and Eve, uh, Falstaff has seduced Prince Hal. So that, that parallel also is there. But then we realize that, uh, well, uh, Satan or no Satan, uh, uh, human beings are supposed to enjoy and morality is an issue uh, which, you know, is a kind of binding for us. So Shakespeare is, makes this point very seriously uh, in, 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 in this play regarding this particular paradigm. And, and if in history Falstaff appears, he appears at a certain point of time. That time is 1600. That is the time, you know, when, when masses have come, uh, moved to the street, uh, when they, you know, uh, uh, discuss their issues from the, the, their own point of view, when they are critical even of the monarch, because the monarch is not able to solve the problems of, of, of poverty, illiteracy and backwardness. And uh, there are religious, you know, discussions going on, debates going on, and these debates, you know, don't do any, any, any good to uh, uh, ordinary masses as human beings. So this kind of a, uh, you know, paradigm has uh, potentially emerged in history, and Shakespeare is able to capture this paradigm in the figure of Falstaff. 
So, uh, uh, friends, uh, <coughs> uh, I uh, finally make the last comment and uh, in, 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 as a matter of conclusion. And that comment in is that it's not merely history play. It's not merely uh, you know a play about governance, about politics. It's very rich in content. And its richness lies not merely in the issues it raises, but in the language it uses. You know, there, there are large chunks of prose in the, in, 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 in the, in the play. And uh, the, these chunks of prose, you know, have, uh, uh, have become necessary uh, in, in the play because there are ordinary people and they can't speak the, uh, the, the, the kind of meter. And they can't use the kind of meter that Shakespeare is using for his, uh, for, for, for his play in general. So, uh, well, uh, uh, I hope, uh, viewers, that uh, you, you have uh, uh, seen these points, uh, uh, the, the way I present them. Uh, I, I don't give any definitive, definitive answers to the questions I raise. I merely shared with you uh, two or three perspectives. And I think that you will take the discussion uh, to other uh, texts uh, in, in your course. And uh, some of you might even take the discussion uh, from this text through other texts also to your life. As, as I've been thinking about life, uh, why, why, why do you know reading this play? Thank you.